our program as chair of Beth Israel's Lifelong Learning Committee. I want to welcome everybody here this morning to what promises to be a very informative and interesting somebody presentation. Sure Could you, um, everybody put yourselves on mute. This program is being sponsored by the Howard and Sandy Bernheim Fund for Holocaust Education. And we thank the Bernheims once again for their generosity. Our guest speaker, Professor Freund, has directed over a dozen archeological projects in Israel, including sites associated with the beginnings of Christianity and Judaism at Nazareth, Beth Saida, Yavne, and Kumar, and here. site of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In addition, he has directed projects in Spain, Poland, Rhodes, Greece, and Lithuania. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and Reader's Digest, Newsweek, Archaeology, and in, and in three major articles in the Smithsonian Magazine. Professor Freund has been featured on BBC, MSNBC, CNN, NPR, and Fox News in hundreds of media outlets worldwide and in 20 television documentaries from National Geographic, CNN, Discovery, History Channel, and PBS. His 2016 work in Lithuania was chronicled one of the most viewed episodes of Nova's science series episode entitled Holocaust Escape Tunnel on the new discoveries made in the Ponar burial pits and the great synagogue of Vilna, Lithuania that has been seen around the world. Dr. Freund is author of over 100 scholarly articles and 12 books written and co-edited including his newest book, Archaeology of the Holocaust, Vilna, Roads, and Escape Tunnels, and that is available nationwide. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Richard Freund. Okay, boy, further delay. <laughs> we, were supposed to, we were supposed to be together in April, and uh, any further delay, and I was wor worried that you, you didn't want me. You didn't want me. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to uh, give you the backstory of the good Nazi. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody's seen it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the uh, trailer for the documentary. And if you're wondering if your friends have ever seen this or people in Israel have ever seen it, it was the most watched television documentary in Israel on the last Yom HaShoah. And the reason is because on Yom HaShoah in Israel, they show only uh, Holocaust material. So uh, last year in Israel, they played two of my documentaries. One was Holocaust Escape Tunnel and the other was The Good Nazi. And by far, The Good Nazi was seen twice that, that same day. And people uh, are just generally moved by it. So what I'm going to do is just because I know everybody has seen it, or maybe they haven't seen it, or they, maybe they can go to the end. So I'll show you the, the trailer. And after the trailer, I'll show you uh, the backstory in a PowerPoint. So hold on. OK. Oh, remember him as the good German. He was very, very isolated and afraid that the SS would find out that his intention is to save them. Why would a Nazi major be protecting and saving Jews when the rest of the Germans in Vilna were committed to slaughtering them? HPP is unique. It's a killing field where people are still living. We're trying to locate a mass burial site. You can identify where things happen without having to excavate. We were hiding underneath the floor. They were taking the children to be killed. 
and I was saved on top of the roof. This could be where the hole was that extended down under the foundation and into this space. We have two distinct pits here. It's highly likely that there are still bodies in that area. This is where they hid a hundred people packed into these footings. That's all we could hear was crying, screaming, machine gun, silence. So before I do my PowerPoint, I want to, I want to uh, tell you a few things that uh, didn't get into the movie. I think they're important. Um, I've done now uh, 60 projects worldwide. Uh, when people say 60 archaeological projects worldwide, uh, some people in a lifetime do one, maybe two. And how is it possible that my team has done 60 projects worldwide. And the reason is because I have a new technique. The technique that I'm gonna be talking about is called non-invasive archeology. span So for those of you who are not experts in archeology, span I'm gonna tell you the dirty little secret of archeology. span it's not, it's not a pretty thing, so I want you to be prepared. Archaeology is the most destructive science on earth. Whenever we do archaeology, we destroy the sample. Um, usually in science, usually in science, uh, you can repeat the, the experiment again. In traditional archaeology, you can never repeat the experiment again. Once you open things up, once you take it out, it's really never in the right place ever again. Also, I'm gonna tell you the other dirty secret. Archeology span is very, very labor intensive. At one site I've been working, working on since 1989, 1989, we have uncovered two and a half acres with 10,000 students, <laughs> two and a half acres. It would take three lifetimes to do this site. And I have to tell you, the reason is because the way it's done is extremely labor intensive. You need lots of students, you need lots of time. And I have to tell you, it's also expensive. Uh, traditional archeology span is very expensive. I had to build a lab in Israel, I had to build, uh, 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 a place to process all the finds in, in Spain. All these things are extremely, extremely expensive. They're labor intensive and they're destructive. And I have to tell you the other thing, they're very ineffective, <laughs> very, very, very ineffective. Meaning when in archeology, span what we do is we take something, we remove it from this place. So we're destroying it. We then move it to a lab, we work on it, and then we bring it back to the site to put it back in its original location. And then someone asks you, so what is that? And they go, and you, in the end, you say, well, it could be this or it could be that. So beyond all these other things, it is also very insensitive. Archaeology is one of these things that you do because it's there. And sometimes you should not be excavating what you're excavating. So what I'm trying to give you the sense is, is that although it is a wonderful technique, archeology, span I knew there was something wrong. So what was my solution? My solution was something that I happened on. Um, and I'll tell you, this is a, you know, one of these stories that happens, maybe it's happened to you. 
I was at a, at a conference for archaeology in New York City. And, you know, I'm not paying attention. I came in late. I uh, ran into a, a session and I'm sitting in the back and the person's showing slides. And, you know, you sit there for a while. And I'm sitting there for a while. And I realized after about 20 minutes that I was in the wrong conference. I was not at the archaeology conference. I was at the gas and oil exploration conference. And I'm I, so I stayed to the I stayed to the end, and you know, listening to I'm listening to these uh, uh, geoarchaeologists, these uh, uh, geophysicists, and what they were doing was explaining this new technology that they were using called electrical resistivity tomography. Electrical resistivity tomography is an MRI for the ground, and gas and oil industry uses this because they will not spend one cent on exploration if they don't know absolutely that there is something there and they don't want to spend one cent if they can't get to it so they developed the technology which is a tomography it's a electrical and they put um, electrodes in the earth and the electrodes shoot electricity into the ground. And the resistance below the ground is then fed into a computer. And they can color code everything below the surface down to 60, 80, 100 feet. Meaning, if they're looking for gas and oil, they, they know that it's there. And they can tell the difference between stone bone, glass, metal, and fired pottery. And basically, it's, it's just different color-coded uh, parts of this tomography that comes up on the computer screen. And they can say, yes, we can get there. This is the drill we need. And there is gas down there. So after, after the lecture in New York, after I was in, this raw, in the wrong place, I went up to the geophysicist and I said, you know, this would be great to use in archaeology because we're also looking for artifacts. We're looking to see what's below the surface and you can provide a map of that and maybe you want to work with us. So, you know, the guy says to me, look, uh, I, I don't really own, the, own this, uh, this equipment, but you can come and, and talk to my boss. I said, where are you? He said, in Calgary, Canada. That's where we do all of our, uh, that's where this company is. And you can come and talk to the boss and see what, what he thinks about it. So I flew to Calgary and I sat down with the CEO of this gas and oil company. And I don't know if you remember, this is, a, by the way, this is in the mid nineties when Gas and oil companies had a really bad name. They still have a bad name, but it had a really bad name. So I said to him, how would you like to put on your website? Saving civilization one site at a time. So the guy, CEO, CEO looks at me and says, wow, that's, that's pretty good. And uh, how much is this going to cost us? And I said, nothing. Going to cost you absolutely nothing. I said so. So what's the what do I have to do? I said every year, you have to give me two geophysicists and a half a million dollars worth of your equipment on loan to my university, and I'm going to go out to the field. We're going to investigate a site, a variety of sites, and then I'm going to come back. You can put on your website, saving civilization one site at a time. So he says, I like it. It's okay. Pro bono work. It's great. These people are going to love it. And every, every year since uh, about 1995, I've been going out to the field with geophysicists, with their equipment, which, by the way, just so it's very clear, no university could own this equipment because it has to be constantly updated. Software has to be constantly updated. And because this is a private industry, they do it because they're making millions and millions of dollars 
off gas and oil and uh, natural resources. So they update this equipment all the time. And I am the beneficiary, or at least my group is the beneficiary. So in my group, I have chemists and bio biologists. I have cartographers. I have geoscientists. And I have geophysicists. And every place we go, we get invited to. So for those of you who don't know, I've been doing this now for 25 years. Every place I go, I have to be invited. And then when I go to the country that I'm working in, I do something very odd. If I'm bringing half a million dollars worth of equipment to a country like Lithuania or Poland or Latvia, I offer it to other archeological groups and institutions for free. So I go to them and I say, look, I'm gonna be in, I'm gonna be in the country for two weeks. I'll come to your site. We'll do uh, an MRI for your ground and we'll tell you what's there. And then we'll collaborate on a project together. So this may not seem to be a good way to do business, but it's a wonderful way to do business because what it does is I have now convinced thousands and thousands of archeologists worldwide that before they touch the earth, before they put a spade in the ground, that they do this MRI for the ground. So now that I've told you about it, I wanna show you. So hold on, let's do, make sure that we can get my See if I can get my PowerPoint up. Hold on. Okay. Let's see if I can get it now. Okay. And I'm gonna take, take it up so everybody can see it. Can everybody see this? Can somebody unmute and tell me whether they can see this? Hello? Yes, yes we can see it. Okay. We can right. see it. Okay. So this yes, is the back story. Okay. This is the back story of this. Uh, this whole story. And um, I should tell you one more backstory before, before I start, because it's not in my PowerPoint. Um, so I was in, I've been working in Lithuania since 2015. And in 2015, I went there essentially to start a project at the Great Synagogue of Vilna. Now, if you don't know, Great Synagogue, Great Synagogue of Vilna was destroyed in World War II. And uh, after the war, the Soviets, in their good Soviet way, uh, decided to build a, an elementary school over the Great Synagogue, where it had been. So basically, I'd gone to uh, Lithuania to see if there was any remnants of the Great Synagogue still left underneath the elementary school. So it turns out there was a secret to the Great Synagogue, which I discovered very quickly. The secret was that the Great Synagogue in, could not be built at the height that they, the Jews wanted it to. It was an ecclesiastical rule in uh, Lithuania. Actually, it's all over uh, Europe that the Jews could not build a synagogue any higher than the local church. But the, the Jews of Vilna wanted to build the, this massive, very tall synagogue and couldn't figure out how to do that. And so you can imagine in a synagogue meeting, you can imagine this, this is a synagogue meeting and, they, and they're all sitting around a table and they say, 
what can we do? We can't build the synagogue the way we wanted to. And we want it to be five stories high. It would be the tallest uh, building in, in Vilna. And we can't because the local church is three stories high. So somebody on that board, and if you've ever been on a synagogue board, maybe this will be meaningful. Somebody on the board said, you know what? Instead of building up, let's build down. So they built the great synagogue, two stories below the street level. And so when the great synagogue was destroyed, everything from the great synagogue, from the top all the way through the bottom, got pushed down below the street level. And then when the Soviets came in and built a cement cap and then built an elementary school on top, they ironically preserved it for all time. And so when we came in, in 2015, we did ground penetrating radar, which is another technique I'm gonna show you in a minute. And we started to discover that all around the outside of the school were huge, huge remnants of the great synagogue. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna just, just tell everybody, we gotta destroy the elementary school to get to the x -ray. No. I came up with a plan, which I think was the best plan they had, which was we wanted to excavate an area. So we went to the, the uh, playground in the back of the elementary school. And what we did there was we excavated the, the playground. And what did we do? We slowly started to take out, out of the playground, 150,000 artifacts. 150,000 artifacts. Then we excavated in front of the school and we took out another 50,000 artif artifacts. So the mayor and the, and the prime minister and the president decided, you know what? The great synagogue is still there. Let's see what's underneath the school. So they gave us the right to now check underneath the school. And there we found the bima of the great synagogue still sitting there with inscriptions, with plaques from each one of the seats that said somebody's name from the great synagogue. So the, you should know the end of the story, end of the story is that the, the government gave the uh, the elementary school to the Jewish community. And we've now uh, gonna be finishing next year. It's gonna be turned into a museum. So I came in 2015 to do that work. So when I was there in the country, I decided that I would give every single different group in Lithuania the opportunity to propose a project. So one of the projects they proposed to me was Ponar. This is a burial pit outside, about 10, 10 kilometers outside of uh, uh, Vilna. And they said, can you see if there's any more burial pits? Because what we did was we only found about four or five of them. We think that there were more. I said, oh, that's a good, that's a good thing because for geophysics, we can tell where there's mass burials without having to dig them up. And then a little sheepishly, the Vilna Gaon Jewish State Museum said, you know what? There's a great story about people who were in the burial pit, who dug a tunnel out of the burial pit, a hundred foot long tunnel. Can you see if, if anything like that exists? whether there was a tunnel uh, out of a burial pit, and we, nobody believes it. So if you didn't see it, you should see it. It's on, it's on YouTube, Holocaust Escape Tunnel. And it's a story about how we discovered using geophysics, this tunnel that was dug by Jewish inmates in burial, in a burial pit who had been brought in to actually destroy all the evidence of 
the destruction that went on at Ponar. And then one other group came to us, another museum came to us and said, look, we have a place in town which is still being used by people. It's a, an apartment complex, 216 apartments. People still live there. But during the Holocaust, there was this really strange incident where a Nazi major decided to save the last remnant of the Vilna ghetto by putting them into an apartment complex. And they were there right through the end of the war, right through 1944 when the Soviets came in. But it's gonna be uh, destroyed now in urban renewal. Do you think you can go take a look at it? So I went in 2015 with a few of the people from the museum and they showed me this place called HKP, Hare's Kraft Park, which means army um, car repair site. And this army repair site was set up by Major Karl Plaga weeks before the destruction of the Vilna Ghetto. And it was in bad shape, but there was still 216 really good, I'm gonna show you what they look like, really good apartment buildings and apartments where all these people lived. And they were literally saved right before the destruction of the uh, Vilna Ghetto. So I looked at it and I saw that part of it had just been burned down. You can always tell be, before something is gonna be urban renewal, that people start to see opportunities to hasten the process. So I said, you know what? We're gonna do HKP. And I said, Carl Plaga, where have I heard that name before? So this is 2015. You know where I'd heard the name before? When I was in Hartford in 2005, a man came to me, a medical doctor from Middletown, Connecticut. His name was Michael Good. And he had written a book about this altruistic Nazi by the name of Karl Plage. And so his parents and his grandparents had been at HKP. And he wrote the book and he gave this talk and I listened to him and I said, wow, that's a good story. I wonder if it's true. I wonder if it's true. And there I was. 10 years later, standing in front of HKP. So you know what I did? <laughs> I pulled out my cell phone and I tried to call him on the telephone, but he's a very busy doctor. So I called him and his nurse gets on the telephone. He says, would you like an appointment? And I said, no, I would like to talk to Dr. Good. Is he available? He says, who is this? Tell him it's Dr. Freund. And I'm in Vilma at HKP. And she says, what? I said, yes, I'm in Lithuania and I need to talk to Dr. Good. I said, well, he's a very busy man. I'll see if he can get back to you. I don't know. And so basically at that moment, I agreed for our science group to do this project. And this is the story that I learned. So before I go any, any further, I wanna make sure that everybody um, understands this, this innovation. And, and I'm also going to tell you why, why it became such a, an interesting thing for me. When I talk to people and I explain to them how destructive, how destructive archaeology is, and I explain to them 
Look, if you were going to major surgery, would you not go for an MRI or an X-ray or a CAT scan? Of course you would go for, for a CAT scan. Of course you would go for an X-ray or an MRI. It's, if they're going to do surgery, you want to know exactly where they're going to be doing the surgery, not in some general way. Well, in archaeology, up until today, traditional archaeology, you started at the top and you just went down. So my idea was very simple. If we were going to be doing sensitive places, we need to know exactly where we're excavating. So using this technique, what I've been able to do is I've worked in people's homes. I've worked in mosques. I've worked in churches. I've worked in synagogues. I've worked in bus people's businesses. I've worked at extermination sites mass burial sites, individual graves, cemeteries. We never felt at any moment, and this is very important for Holocaust archeology. span We never felt at any moment that we were going to violate the same victims a second time. In Holocaust archeology, span we try to determine if the site is what it purports to be. We try to determine how big it is, where it starts, where it ends, to calculate as much of what's inside of a burial as possible. But more importantly, we don't have to open the burial. We don't have to open that individual grave. We're able to determine these things without having to uh, victimize the victims a second time. And uh, I will say one thing. It's revel this, this technique is now revolutionizing archeology, span not only for the Holocaust, but all archeology. span Because instead of needlessly destroying an entire site, we excavate only that part that we know where there's things to be retrieved. And then we close it up. And also, I believe, I really believe that this technique will provide a deterrent to the next generation, for the next genocide, when pe possible perpetrators think that they can get away with it, like the Nazis got away with it. You can never get away with genocide. Science will get you. So let me show you the, the site and the rest of our work. So I should say one very unique thing, that much of what I do, I do with students. It's not just like a bunch of, um, let me go back. It's not just like a bunch of uh, uh, professionals go out in the field and do the work. Really, the, the real reason that we do this is because we feel that we can bring students into the field. And I think bringing students into the field is the most important part of it. Um, I will say one thing about students. <laughs> I have to say something about students because unfortunately people do not get this importance. I'm doing this with students now for almost 40 years. 40 years ago, I had great students in the classroom. They read, they were great. They, they wrote great papers. They asked great questions in class. And I take them out to the field and they were a little tentative. How should I say tentative? They, you know, they would say, oh, do I have to get these jeans dirty by getting down on my, uh, my knees? Do I, these are new sneakers. Do I have to get, get them dirty? And they were very tentative. I have been doing this for the past decade with a whole new generation of students. We call them the generation X, Y, and Z. And I should say, these are the students who want to see it for themselves. They want to taste it for themselves. They want to touch it. They want to hear it. They want to be there for the discovery. They want to be involved. That's the way they learn whether something is what it purports to be. 
and they are the best students I have ever had in the field. They're not so great in the classroom, I have to say. They're not, they're not reading as much as they, they used to. They're not writing uh, as well as they used to, but in the field, they are great. They, this is where they shine. So what I've learned from this is I have to take more students to the field than less. And then what happens is when I get them back in the classroom afterwards, they're excellent students because they are now engaged. They now feel like they control the information. So uh, I, I do want to make sure that I, that I say this. So, you know, I say this because you're looking here. Here's one of my students, Nikki Awad. Uh, Nikki Awad, by the way, um, Arabic speaking, Christian, Judaic studies major. So she was asked, because she was asked, because she was been in all these different projects with us. She says, why did you become a Judaic studies major? And you know what she said? I became a Judaic studies major because it's so interesting. And the, the interesting part of it is that she has been out to the field all the time. And she feels that being out in the field is where she's learning. So here she is. By the way, this is the elementary school that I was talking about in downtown Vilna. By the way, you can even see the sign of the street name. The street name is Jidushgatve, which is um, uh, Jew Street, <laughs> Jew Street number one. And this is the elementary school, Jew Street number one. And here we are in front of the in front of the elementary school with ground penetrating radar. And the ground penetrating radar, as you can see, it goes back and forth and he has a computer right, sitting right there and it's collecting in his backpack uh, from a uh, sizable um, uh, area uh, where the electrodes come in and there's a receiver here and she's pulling back and forth and at the end of the day, they basically interpret the information that was on the screen. This is electrical resistivity tomography. These are the electrodes put in the earth. It's the only thing that's invasive, the electrodes. Then there's a car battery sitting here and the car battery, uh, they're all connected by uh, together. And the computer is sitting right there. And basically the electrodes run and they go down into the, into the bedrock, actually through the soil and gravel. By the way, they go through cement. It can go through rebar. It can go through anything at all. So part of the thing that I'm, that I'm doing next year, I should tell you, I was invited by uh, the government of Poland, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, you know, the Warsaw has been totally revamped. But it doesn't matter to me. I can see things underneath buildings, underneath streets. And so they're bringing me back to Poland to look at the entire area of the Warsaw Ghetto, including some of the most iconic places um, of Warsaw that are underneath buildings today or that are memorials like Mila 18. I'm going to be reinvestigating Mila 18. And what's very exciting about it is that when I told them, it does not matter what business is there. It does not matter how deep these sites are. They're still there. If they're still there, they're still there. And we'll find them. So, uh, You've already heard that you've seen the good Nazi. I hope you'll see the Holocaust escape tunnel. Holocaust escape tunnel was seen by 20 million people in 2017, 2018, and 2019. It's seen on uh, PBS uh, for their offering for Yom HaShoah every year. And the good Nazi, of course, I've told you, has, has been seen worldwide on Discovery. So how do we start? This is how we start. We start usually with historic photographs that we then overlay on a Google Earth 
and we put up a drone over a site. And what were we looking for? So in order to understand what we're looking for, you have to understand something about what happened. So our friend, Major Carl Plaga, brought the Jews, 1,200 plus Jews, 1,200 plus Jews, just like Schindler's List, except he took a greater risk than Schindler. Schindler at any time could have walked away with his money and gone to wherever he wanted to. This guy was a Nazi. He was a Nazi since 1933. He was um, in, the, in the party. He was, uh, his whole career was in the military. And so he was really taking a tremendous risk. Why he did this, I'm going to have to uh, get to later. But what is interesting is he commandeered these two apartment buildings. And I just want everybody to see the apartment buildings. The apartment buildings are still there. And what you can see, what you're going to be able to see is that the apartment buildings are by an, uh, a large highway, comes in. And what he did was not only did he take the Jews out of the Vilna ghetto and put them into the apartment building, men, women, and children, which the SS couldn't figure out. What, what do you need children for? What, if it's a labor camp, what do you need children for? And he said, because it's a lot of different work that has to be done on cars that requires tiny hands. So we need these children. Plus, it, it makes the, the workers more able or more wanting to do good work. So he convinced the SS that it's in their, their interest to keep these families together. So men, women, and children. He brought them into the apartments. And then from the very beginning, he told them there will come a time where the SS will no longer allow me to do my work with you. You have to prepare yourselves. So he encouraged them to build malinas. Now, for those of you who have never heard the Yiddish word malina, or it's a, also a Russian word, um, malina means a hiding place. So he wanted them to construct inside of their apartment buildings places where they could hide in the event that the SS came to take them away. He says, someday I will not be able to protect you. Prepare yourselves. So as we're going to see, that's going to be a part, uh, important part of it. The second thing that we were looking for, we were, so we were looking at people's apartments. And by the way, there's still people living there. It's the only Holocaust site I've ever been at where the people, there's still people living at the site. So people, we knocked on doors and we came in with concrete scanners where we can look behind their walls and to see if they had um, molinas built in their apartment. We, did, we, we surprised a few people because we came in and we, we said, yes, you do. And they said, am I gonna find something when I open it up that's scary? And I said, I don't know what to tell you. We know that there is a, 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 um, a false wall here. It was put in probably in 1942, 1943. And you, you will find that there might be something of the people who live there. So a lot of people said, well, I don't know if I, I'm going to opt for that. Um, so first thing is we were looking for the, the Molinas. Second thing we're looking for is in July of 1944, right before the Soviets were going to come into Lithuania on going, of course, to the West, they were going to come in. They knew that the Soviets were going to get there. So the Nazis decided that they um, were going to clean up HKP. So on July 1st, they came and they, the SS met with 
all of the prisoners, all the Jews of HKP with the Karl Plaga standing there. And Karl Plaga made this impassioned speech to them. And he said, look, this is the SS. On Monday, the SS will be escorting you out of the camp. And as you know, the SS is, knows very well what to do with the people that they escort out of camps. I am being shipped off to the Eastern Front. I can't help you. Goodbye. And basically he was warning them that they had until Monday to get into their Molinas and hide. And hopefully they'll be able to be protected in the Molinas. So half of the Jews, over 600 of them, went into, went into hiding. Another 500 of them on Monday showed up at roll call from the SS, thinking they were going to be escorted out of the camp. And the 500 that showed up were all shot. And the people who were in hiding could hear their friends and neighbors all being shot. So what did they do? They stayed in their place and they waited three, four, five days. And by July 11th, the Soviets showed up. And what did they do? The Soviets came to this place and suddenly the Jews started to come out of their hiding places. And what did they find? They found that there was all these people dead, still sitting there. So all those Jews buried their friends and compatriots at the site. So this site, this site here, what we were looking for is we were looking inside the buildings to see what was inside the buildings. We wanted to know if there were Molinas inside, but also we were looking for um, the burial places around the entire site. And of course, looking for burial places is not an easy thing, especially when everything is all built on. So what we did was we did what we normally do was we did all the ground penetrating radar and the electrical resistivity tomography to basically guide us. So now that you've heard a lot about this, I'm gonna give you the, the, the specifics. So Karl Plaga, Karl Plaga was a very unusual man. Uh, he was like, as I say, Oscar Schindler. Why did he flip? Why did he, he was a good Nazi, meaning he was a very dutiful Nazi from 1933 until he came to Vilna in 1942. And what he started to realize is the war had flipped him, meaning he had looked at what the Nazis were doing and he found it reprehensible. He could not, as a military man, justify anything about what they were doing. So when he heard about the plan for the liquidation of the Vilna ghetto, it was going to take place on September 23rd. He got everybody that was still left out of that he could justify to get into this new uh, HKP setting, the army vehicle repair shop that he was uh, planning. Who is he? So here is Major Carl Plog on the right. On the left is Baron Maurice de Hirsch. You're saying, what, the, what, what do these two, two people have to do with one another? Um, Baron Maurice de Hirsch built the apartments that I'm going to show you. He built them in 1898, 
really they were finished by by 1900. Um, he built them for billiker or cheap housing for the Jewish poor of Vilna. How, how ironic this is. So he built them in 1898, 1900, and they were used right through the war and they're still being used today. So here is the Hirsch and here is Plage. These are the apartment buildings. Six floors, 216 apartments, two different buildings, and they were used from 1898 to 1943. And they were, you know, they were brick buildings. And this, by the way, this is where some of the people were buried when they were killed in July of 1943. And another part, we found another area where they were buried as well. Cindy's parents. So here's our work. Here's the work. Here's the students doing the work, uh, doing ground penetrating radar at the site. We didn't really know where, in fact, the people were buried. So what we had to do was we had to wait, go, let me go back. What we had to do was we had to look to see where there were areas where there were uh, deep depressions and to see whether there's any area there to bury them. In the end, it, this was the area, one area here, and we can discover one area on the side of the building. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Karl Plage. So Karl Plage, regular Nazi, born in Darmstadt, was a Wehrmacht uh, officer, engineer, Nazi party member. And as I say, he flipped. The question is, what made him flip? You know, there's a lot of Nazis that experienced the same things he did. And yet he decided to change, to do something about it. And by the way, the, the fact that he turned himself into like a Colonel Klink um, in um, Hogan's Heroes, meaning he was in on all of the, the work that the Jews were doing, still is just very unusual, very unusual. Why would he do that? Why would he risk his entire career, his life in order to save these Jews? I have some theories, I'll share them with you in a minute. But more importantly, after the war, because remember, so in 1943, he shipped off to the Eastern Front, he survives the Eastern Front, comes back to Darmstadt in 1945. He basically sees himself as uh, have done nothing, had done nothing during the war. And he did not see himself as with clean hands because he didn't know what happened to the Jews in 1945. And he was brought up, you know, they did these Nazi trials after the war. Everybody knows the Nuremberg trials. There were smaller trials being done for captains and lieutenants like him. So he was a major. And when asked whether he was complicit with the Nazis, he basically said that he was complicit. And he would have been put in jail, but for the fact that suddenly, out of thousands and thousands of people, the Jews who he had saved came to his defense. And they came to his defense and they said, no, this man saved us. And so he was not charged, not put in prison, went back to Darmstadt, lived until 1957, died a young 1957. It's not clear though. He never really spoke too much about what he, why he did it. So when we reconstruct why he did it, I have to point to three things. Number one, 
he had been in World War I, and after World War I, he contracted polio. And he had to live through polio. And for most of his life, that was something that uh, made him extremely uncomfortable, but it also gave him a tremendous amount of empathy for others. The second thing is, he was literally shocked by the way Jews were treated in, in Vilna. He could not justify anything that was going on. The third thing was, it turns out that as an engineer, he was working for an engineer, engineering firm in Darmstadt that was run by Jews. And after the, um, the laws of 1935 came in, Nuremberg laws in 1935, he basically had to take over a Jewish firm and he was very aware that this was unjust. So we think that his whole psyche was a slow development of a conscience. And I say this because it's very hard to figure out why one person, like a major plague, can do what he does and why there weren't hundreds of major plagues during the war. I should also tell you something very interesting. After the war, in the 1960s, 1970s, after his death, the Jews from HKP put his name in to be a righteous Gentile at Yad Vashem in Israel. And it was rejected. In the 1970s, they put it in again. And it was rejected. And again, in the 1990s, they put it in again, third time. And this time, <laughs> these Jews, who many of them were, were already in their 70s and 80s, said, why is he being rejected? What he did was save the largest contingent of Vilna's Jews, of any single person. And the, the committee came back and said, but he was a Nazi, but he was a Nazi, and he was a Nazi officer. They said, that is the point. He had more at risk than any other righteous Gentile of that area. So in the, after the third try, he was finally um, given the honor of being a righteous Gentile at Yad Vashem. And his family, he had no children, so um, it's only the larger family. The larger family represented him said he would have been very proud. And so it's a very interesting story. And you know, I had, I had 300 students last year, last fall, where I showed the movie and we had a panel and I had a philosopher, had a historian. And what was very interesting about it, the historian said in front of all the students, they said, there is no such thing as a good Nazi. And I turned around to him and I said, I hear what you're saying, Anthony, but in this case, there is a good Nazi an altruistic man who lived up to the ideals of being a good person. Not to mention there was a play, it was also, he didn't understand this, it was also when the uh, producer made the movie, he did a play on words. The person who originally wrote the book, The Good Family, so he was a good Nazi because he was a, a Nazi that was identified by the good family, so. Anyway, so you should know that today the Nazis in, uh, have recognized that he, what he did was very, very uh, important. Um, and they've actually, they have a, uh, a way of 
explaining to the military the way that a military person can make a decision, which is the, uh, the plage ploy, which is a way for someone to fulfill the orders that they're supposed to be doing. Like he was supposed to be setting up a labor camp. He did set up a labor camp, but at the same time, he saved Jews. So he didn't have to kill Jews. He could save Jews and still fulfill his mission as a, um, a major in the Wehrmacht. So they, they today in, in Darmstadt, they actually have a, um, a memorial to him at the military camp, and they actually te teach his, um, his story. So the, the idea of doing this, and I have to say, our goal is always to try to find out if we can give more meaning to a testimony. And so in this case, we, we have the testimonies, not only of um, all the survivors and the children. And I have to say, when we decided to make this documentary, I asked that we find one survivor who could talk on behalf of all the survivors. And we brought him back to HKP. That's Sydney Handler, who appears in the, in the documentary. And I have to tell you, Sydney's firsthand information made the documentary and made the work that we did much more meaningful. It's really one of those parts of, of doing this work that if we did not have the testimonies, it's far more difficult to understand what you're looking at. And I have to say, in another decade, we will not have any more survivors. So how will we continue to do real research if we do not have survivors? So number one, we have the testimonies. And what's very good is we have written and we have, of course, video uh, testimonies. They offer us a lot of information about different sites. The second, science will be able to do this research. We will be able to go out into the field to look at places that are mentioned by these testimonies and to gather information that was not under, uh, otherwise ever gatherable because we use this technique that's not invasive. So just to show you this, this is, this is by the way, what a molina looks like. Usually it's built into, into a wall or an eave of a, of a house or a roof. And one of the survivors who became an architect later was able to draw what the apartment buildings look like. And he was able to show us where there were molinas in which, how, in which houses, where they were, and then we were able to find this massive molina that was underneath the building, which is where we spent a lot of our time trying to find, and we actually found it. So here is Michael, let me go back. Here is Michael Good's book, A Search for Major Plaget by Michael Good. And there is one other book by uh, Simon Malkus on the subject of the righteous of the Wehrmacht. So here is, here's the electrical resistivity tomography being uh, drawn out. This is where we think there was, uh, where they shot everybody. We actually found bullet holes in the sides of the walls that were still there in the bricks. And this was on July 2nd, of course, before uh, and where everybody was in hiding. And remember, people were in hiding in their apartment buildings, in their apartment rooms. So if you look at these different places, someone could be sitting in a false wall that basically is, look, is probably some place in here and they're shooting the people right against the wall. So here's the ground penetrating radar. And at the, one of the things I did at the outset was I took my staff to a molina to show them what we're looking for. So here's the false wall. And this is Sydney Hand Handler 
who was 10 in 1944 when he was at HKP. And he actually was involved in the reburying of some of the victims there. So I know you're trying to, to know what these things look like. So here is one of the burial pits that we found. Dug into the earth. This is, uh, by the way, um, here's, the, here's the area on top. This is about maybe five meters, 15 feet below the surface. And here is uh, ground penetrating radar inside, finding this area right there. We found the area is now capped, but we were actually able to, to locate it. And it led to this area behind here, which is where we were able to go inside and look. And we brought, by the way, uh, Michael Good came with us and so did his son. And for them to go into these areas really was amazing. And I just have to show you two artifacts, which don't mean a lot to you, but I remember when we found these two artifacts and they're mentioned in the film, they were very meaningful to all of us. So this is, for those of you who are uh, aware, this is called a foot lace or a boot maker's for, uh, a form. It's made out of wood. And this is from the Molina. And then this was a children's toy. Now, for those of you who, who are trying to think about what would a children's toy be doing there, is remember in the Molina, they had men, women, and children hiding for three and four days uh, until, uh, actually it ended up being a week, until the uh, Soviets show up. So these children played with something. And they, it was such a primitive um, uh, circus wagon that we had to look to see how it was made but it was made on the basis of other, this is from the 1930s, shoemakers, stock and trade. Because a lot of these people, by the way, were preparing themselves to go out into the world and to make, have a job. So this is the, um, the wooden lace here. And this is a um, uh, circus wagon that a child would be playing with. So to find these things was very meaningful because these are the kinds of things that give context to the work that you're doing. So it's not that we're just only looking for the dead or the spaces where they hid. We're also looking for artifacts that tell us something about who these people were. So I'll, I'll end with I'll end with a couple of just insights before I uh, I finish. We've now known, done actually we've done twenty two sites in Lithuania, six sites in Poland, and four sites in in Rhodes on the archaeology of Holocaust. The story is captured in these two documentaries, and I'm in the middle right now. I've been asked by four countries. Belarus, Lithuania, Poland, and Latvia. And we're gonna be doing an entire uh, full length film for theaters. It will be ready in 2022 on the issue of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust. Because in many cases, people overlook the Jewish resistance that Jews did during the Holocaust, because we're all look, they all look at the Warsaw Ghetto and armed resistance, but Jews were doing cultural resistance, spiritual resistance. They were doing resistance by hiding, by escaping, and by armed revolts. And there were 90 different places where Jews did revolts throughout the thousands of, of concentration camps. And 
what really motivated me to, to take this is I have students, I don't know if you've, if you've ever encountered people like this, who ask the question, why did Jews go like sheep to the slaughter during the Holocaust? And it bothered me. Because I saw different places. Look, I worked at Sobibor. I've worked at, in Warsaw. I've worked in Lithuania, Kaunas, in Kovno, where Jews escaped. And at Ponar, where Jews escaped. And so I'm going to be working at 10 sites where Jews exhibited an inordinate amount of resistance. And they either escaped, they hid, they had armed revolts. And to tell it all in one story, so maybe we can change the paradigm of seeing Jews as victims. Because I think part of this whole problem we, we see in anti-Semitism today is that Jews are victims and they have to be victims. And therefore, they're easy to pick on. And so we're hoping that with this documentary that we'll be teaching people a little bit more. So I told you about Michael Good. I wanna show you his family because I have one more thing that I want to contribute to. This is a Freudism. I'm Freud, so I can say this. Is when we talk about archaeology, we're talking about people. Archaeology, at the end of the day, is really about people. So what's very interesting to me is to find the people, as Michael Good, at his wedding, there's his grandfather, there's his father, there's his mother. Here's a woman I knew in, in Hartford whose father escaped from Fort Seven before, while everybody else was killed, was able to escape, got the family out, came to the United States. So part of the whole thing is to teach people that archaeology is not just about coins and and glass and pottery, it's really about people. And one other thing that I, I did find is, is that we take the testimonies, the thousands and thousands, there's 50,000 just in, in Spielberg, there's another 5,000 at uh, Fortunoff uh, testimonies at Yale, we take the, ter the testimony seriously, but not literally. And we need corrobor corroborating evidence that can scientifically analyze to help people understand what happens. And we must always be aware when we do this type of research, there is a moral question we're trying to understand. And <laughs> if you're interested to find out more about this, you can get my book here, The Archaeology of the Holocaust. It's the only book of its type like this. It's on roads, Vilna, and escape tunnels with a whole chapter on HKP. Or you can get Digging Through History, which is archaeology and faith from Atlantis to the Holocaust and Digging Through the Bible, which really is about uh, modern archaeology in the Bible. So I'll end there. I'll take questions now. I hope people are still awake. So uh, I have a question to ask you. Yes, doctor. Um, you mentioned Baron de Hirsch. Right. My grandfather escaped Kiev back in 1889. Right. And escaped through Constantinople, which is Istanbul. Right. On the Emer to come to America. He didn't right. know the difference between North and South America. Right. They wound up in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Oh, but yes, of course. I spent three years in Buenos Aires. I can tell you all about the Baron de Hearst settlements. 
That's right. My grandfather and his brother and sister that escaped, when they got off the ship in Buenos Aires, they called their Ellis Island the um, hospital center. Right. Anyway, right. there were covered wagons. Right. And took wagon after wagon after wagon up to an area called Santa Fe, which is 200 kilometers from. Right. And they established an area in Argentina called Mosesville. Moses, Moisa Vigia, very famous. I've been there. And it, it really, Baron de Hirsch was before there was any uh, great organized um, uh, community, the colonization uh, organization that he put together right. allowed him to decide to invest in the purchase of large tracts of lands to put Jews. And by the way, there was a plan to move all the Jews, all the Jews to Latin America. They were gonna buy an area from, it's part of Brazil today and uh, in uh, Argentina. And they were gonna put all those Jews who could not be kept safe in, your, in Eastern Europe. They were gonna bring them all to Argentina and Brazil. And they were gonna put the uh, 200,000, 300,000. They ended up bringing about 50,000. And it was a tremendous, I have to say, the settlements in uh, Argentina are just tremendous. So like, even Moise Vigia, that is now, there's almost no Jews there, but all the, the synagogues, and the Bez Midrash and the libraries and the cultural institutions are still there. So for people who are looking to, to understand just how functional this kind of, of, we have to call it charity, this tzedakah that um, Baron de Hirsch did. And there's many places where Baron de Hirsch is honored in these places because they realized this, this was a way of trying to avert, which was the, the final re result of, of, of the Holocaust, is to get these people out of Europe to safer places. Well, so, fortunately, for because of Baron the Hirsch, my grandfather was eventually able to come to America, to Baltimore, and that's why I'm here. Uh -huh. and here but I still have a large family contingency in, in Buenos Aires. And we've well, been you, back several times. But you've never been there. Have you been there? Oh, several times. Oh, good. So you see, it is we've a way to Plata, and we've been to Panagonia, as well right. as Buenos Aires, Mosesville. It's a very interesting but, uh, uh, story because really it was a very successful kibbutz movement outside of Israel. Well, thank you very much for enlightening me on Baron de Hirsch. Okay. Other questions? No other questions. Oh my gosh, uh, I'm waiting. <laughs> this is I have a question, but uh, the, the sketches that, is, that you showed of the buildings right. uh, reminded me of apartment buildings in this country that were built during that same time. They all had uh, mostly below ground basements with small rooms that were intended for coal. The, the home right, was exactly, coal. right. And the sketches sort of suggested to my mind, right. that perhaps those were coal storage rooms. Exactly. And when the Jews had the opportunity to look for hiding places and seal them, they may have sealed off the windows and entrances to it. Right. So they were originally, you're, you're absolutely correct. They were originally places where coal would have come in. By the 1940s, uh, they had come up with a different system. And, uh, but what is interesting is these areas below the, uh, the building themselves made great places to, to, to hide. The second place, which was, which was in the eaves of, the, um, of these uh, large apartment buildings near the roof. That's where Sidney Handler uh, says he, he hid. And of course, inside of the, the um, 
the actual rooms where they lived, they were able to um, put in these false walls. And <laughs> when you go to somebody's apartment and you tell them that the, behind your refrigerator is probably a, uh, a false wall. And so, you know, they feel like it's HGTV. They said, can I take that wall out and extend my apartment? But in, <laughs> in this case, what I tried to, to encourage them is I would keep it just as it is. Because when they open those walls, of course, they don't know what they're going to find. And I don't want to be responsible for whatever they find. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Boyne, this is David Braitman. Uh, I'm just wondering, at the mass burial sites, I saw in the film that they did put up a grave marker. Right. But, uh, was anything else done to, you know, bury these people properly in a Jewish way? I, I you know, this get is, that impression. This is... This is the problem. Let's let me be frank about this. That um, I'm now at Ponar. We found a burial, mass burial, uh, which had about uh, fifteen thousand people inside. It's in the forest. The only thing we can do is mark them, because yeah. the, the when we try to open these, okay, when we try to open these. Right. What, what, you, what, you, what you start is a whole process. And the rabbinate has been very, very uh, want to allow you to do very much. And I should tell you that uh, the, the cemetery in Vilna, which is, uh, there's a new Thanks cemetery that. and an old cemetery. The old cemetery of Vilna is itself a big, a big problem. Because the old cemetery of Vilna, I hope you're ready for this, the Soviet government decided to build an athletic complex back in the 1970s. Right. Right. And they built it on top of the old Jewish cemetery where the Vilna right. Gone was very... So what, what they did was, they, there was such outrage, such outrage at the time. What did they do? They said, we're taking the Vilna Gone and all the graves around him and we're, repl we're putting them into the new cemetery. There were thousands of people, thousands of people that were in that cemetery. So they brought me there um, in 2015. They said, would you like to see if there, there's still any graves underneath this, and I see this big, massive um, athletic complex. And I said, wait, the athletic complex, it probably is built on top of the cemetery. Oh yes, it was built right on top of the cemetery. I said, well, you know, I think this is a little complicated because if I find that, what are you gonna do with the, the um, athletic complex? They said, well, there's nothing there anymore, nothing. We took everything out. I said, uh-huh. So I decided not to do that. The problem today is when you're dealing with mass burials, what do you do with the burials that you find? So I'll give you three of my own circumstances. I'm in Spain working at a site and I get a call they're building a, an apartment complex in Spain, okay, in Valencia, I'll just tell you. And the, they discovered an old Jewish cemetery. Where are they going to take the bodies? And I said, well, you really can't move them. You have to keep them there, and you have to build the, um, the apartment complex in another place. And so... Negotiations went on for about a year. And in the end, Israel decided to take all the, the people in that burial, fly all the bodies to Israel and bury them in Israel. That's one solution. You can only do that if the rabbis in a country agree and that the rabbis in Israel agree. The second possibility is what we are doing, which is to leave them in place, to mark it as a burial place, 
and to have everybody know, meaning we deposit the, the maps in the municipality. The municipality knows they can't build there. And this is, this is a, a mass barrier. The third possibility is that they be moved to a Jewish cemetery. Unfortunately, in, in, I have to say that um, in Lithuania, there are hundreds of cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries that need tending to. Meaning there was a cemetery there in the time of the Nazis and then in the time of the Soviets, many of these Nazis and Soviets took the stones from the cemetery to use for paving. And so the cemeteries themselves need to be totally worked on. So it just is not a convenient solution. So those three solutions are the, are the three solutions. And by the way, for rabbis, this is a, a very big deal. They would prefer not to do anything, just identify the site. Any so this is this is a problem, though. This is a problem. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have one question. Why why is this site still around, the HKP? I mean, why is it, why is it still around? You said it was the you said it was the only place that you went that had people there. Right. So I was just wondering, why did it stick around for so many years? First of all, they're very, Baron de Hirsch built very well um, constructed uh, okay. buildings. <laughs> it's... Ooh. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, these brick buildings that were built in 1898 to 1900 are really good brick buildings. And housing is very expensive in Vilnius. And people, it's actually a good place to live. It's very close to the downtown. And so for the most part, they would love to keep these buildings up, but they are in very, very big disrepair. So that's how my whole thing started, is I was so worried that they were going to do urban renewal, destroy the entire place, and you would never see it. It would be paved over. And yes, I could actually find all these places, but it's much easier to find them when they are still standing. And it's really the only reason why it's still standing is because it is still a good place to live. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so I have a question. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Freud, for your enlightening presentation. My parents uh, live in Hartford, and they're very familiar with your fine reputation as well. So I thank you for that. Okay. My question is, of the 500 uh, doomed Jews that, that showed up during the SS, right. what were their characteristics? What made uh. them decide that they were going to do that? Was it self-serving sacrifice for the other people hiding? Did they take a lottery? What what was their uh, um, modus so operandi? Is, so I'm going to tell you what, what, what I found out. There's three types of Jews who showed up on that Monday for the roll call for the SS. There were Jews who did not have their own uh, Molina. They just didn't have a place to go. There was just no room for them. Uh, that's one, one group. Second group were people who believed truly, look, the end of the war, they need us. They need, the, they need these Jews as workers. They're gonna take us, we're gonna go to another site, we're gonna work, we're gonna be able to live out the war and we'll, so they really believed the, the SS propaganda that they were gonna escort them to a new place. They were gonna go to a labor camp and they're gonna work again. And the third, third group of Jews were rule followers. They were rule followers. Do you know people like this? The rule is they told you to come to roll call, that you're going to come to roll call on Monday. 
most of the Jews who tried to convince these other people realized that, first of all, the lucky Jews were the ones who had Molinas, who were all the time figuring out how they were going to save themselves if the SS ever came. The second group of Jews were people who really said to themselves, I don't believe the Nazi propaganda. Every single person from the Vilna ghetto that was taken out and killed at Ponar was told they were going to a labor camp. And by the end, everybody knew that when they said labor camp, they meant they're going to take them to Ponar and shoot them. But the third group were the rule followers. And if there's anything that we have to learn from this, is that Jews who are, who are rule followers, you have to be very careful about whose rules you're following. And in this case, the idea that um, they could follow these rules and then show up to roll call and then be killed really is the ultimate indignity. So um, what can I say? It, it's it really, this is, these are the characteristics. And you know, I, I have to tell you when, the, when I'm teaching, teaching this in class and I'm teaching by the way, 18 to 22 year olds and you're teaching them and, and students ask that same question. Why would they go? Why wouldn't they all try to hide? And I said, some of them couldn't hide, but some of them felt that they were gonna to go to another labor camp. They believed the Nazi. And what is very interesting is how much 18 to 22 year olds learn about the world from the Holocaust. What they learn, they learn that rule following is only when you know that the rules are right. Propaganda is something that you should be very wary of and always try to find a way to find a plan B, an escape hatch. So <laughs> I have to tell you, if these are, if the, these are what I call the peripheral lessons the Holocaust teaches millennials, generation X, Y, and Z, they learn the lessons well. And that's why, one of the reasons why the, there's never a moment today where I don't feel like this generation is going to be a good generation of kids. Because if I can get them to the field, teach them those lessons, they'll come back and they'll be productive citizens, just like you. Thanks. Dr. Freund, thank you so much for taking us through such a profound and interesting journey this morning. Um, we really appreciate it. You have opened our eyes on this subject and it was really, I know we scheduled this as a Yom HaShoah event, but right. it was a very appropriate Kristallnacht event. As right, a, that's, so, that's so strange that we ended up as a Kristallnacht, but it doesn't mean that I can't come to Baltimore at some time. So oh, you'll think about it. Maybe I'll find another opportunity to come oh, up to Baltimore. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'd like to thank Valerie Fowler for her technical expertise once again in helping us. And if, bring us if you here. still want to watch the film, it is available on our website for two more days. Right. Um, it's a really, really wonderful film. It's about 52 minutes long. Um, the link is available on our website until Tuesday. Um, and uh, we will post a video of this recording for anybody who you know of who wanted to come to this this morning but couldn't see it. Great. Okay. Well, be well. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, everybody can say it now, Yanu, and stay well. <laughs> stay well. And uh, very safe. much for an enlightening morning. Okay. Yes, thank Wonderful. You. Thank, thank you so much. Be well, stay safe. An excellent program. Thanks to the Bernheim family for funding this. <laughs> <laughs>